And um, so you were pressing for a circuit breaker lockdown yes. in September. So if the Prime Minister wasn't persuaded, in your words, of the importance of this, whose advice was he taking? I wasn't taking any advice. He was just making his own decision that he was going to ignore the advice. So there was, was, did his cabinet agree with his decision? The cabinet wasn't involved or asked. Did you hear any anything from cabinet members about these decisions? Um, there were sort of different views. I think. I mean, I've been very critical of Matt Hancock, um, but I think Hancock agreed with me actually in September about acting acting then. Okay. And. Um, but there wasn't any formal um, cabinet meeting to discuss it, or if it was, it was a purely Potemkin exercise. It wasn't the kind of real dis discussion that actually affected So all of these decisions were entirely the Prime Minister's? On the September lockdown, correct. The, the, now, I understand the meeting with SAID representative and the Chancellor and the Prime Minister back in September, um, where they were told of the, the importance of the uh, lockdown. Yes, um, I was the, there, yeah. The, you were there as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. What was the Chancellor's view on this? The Chancellor's view was the Department for Health, who want to do this, have no plan. There is no plan for what to do. Like we've just we've just gone through a whole thing where we had all of these arguments in June, July, and um, you know some people like Dom said, don't do get back to work, don't just try and go hell for leather for the economy, but you decided to do it. And now the Department of Health is suddenly hitting the panic button again and saying, well, we've got to stop for two weeks. And then what? Then are we going to tell everyone to go back to work again? And then what? They're two weeks later to say the opposite? Like, there is no plan. There is no coherence to anything. Um, so, so knowing that the Department for Health was, was chaotic in its approach here, um, was the economic arguments, were they um, outweighing everything else at this point? For the Prime Minister, yes. And there was talk, and certainly the Scottish Government were pushing hard following that SAGE advice for an extension of the furlough scheme. Why was that not discussed more seriously at that point? Because it was only eventually extended at the very last minute. Uh, I can't remember all the kind of time um, details on, on, on timing with that, I'm afraid, but I know all the way along um, Rishi and his team took the whole issue about... Remember, they came up with the idea. It wasn't us in number 10. Um, they came up with the idea to do it, um, and once the Prime Minister said at each stage I'm going to do X and I've made a decision, the Chancellor always uh, extremely competently and extremely ably and effectively kind of rode in and said, right, here's the economic pack and package, made it happen. package to go along with it, and he made it happen. Do yeah. you think if a different Prime Minister had been in number 10, things would have been managed in a, a different way? Uh, undoubtedly, yes. So his predecessors? Um, you mean, what do I think each of his predecessors would have done in that well, situation? Just, yeah. If it had been David Cameron and Theresa May? I mean, it's all, it's all a bit hypothetical. God only knows what, 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 what each of them would do. But I would say, if you took um, anybody at random from the kind of top 1% competent people in this country and presented them with the situation, they would have behaved differently to how the Prime Minister behaved. So, if we're describing his behaviour at that point, was it driven by arrogance, complacency, or was it something more sinister? No, he just didn't. I think, so I think there's, a, there's a great misunderstanding people have that because it nearly killed him, therefore he must have taken it seriously. But in fact, after the first lockdown, his view was he was cross with me and for others into what he regarded as basically pushing him into the first lockdown. His argument after that happened was, literally, quote, I should have been the mayor of Jaws and kept the beaches open. That's, that's what he said on many, many occasions. So did he, didn't think, he, didn't, he didn't think in July or September, thank goodness we were pushed, you know, thank goodness we did the first lockdown, it was obviously the right thing to do, etc., etc. His argument then was, we shouldn't have done the first lockdown, and I'm not going to make the same mistake again. So that does sound like arrogance. I don't know, about, I don't know if arrogance is the right thing. It's just he, he, he as, I, as I said in the earlier session, the Prime Minister took the view in January, February that 
economic harm caused by action against COVID was going to be more damaging to the country than COVID. And we could not persuade him that if you basically took the view of let it rip and not worry about COVID, you would get not just all the health disasters, but you would also then get a huge economic disaster because if people are faced with not having any health system, which is what we were faced with in March if we'd gone down plan A, or what we would have been faced with if we hadn't finally put the brakes on in October, then people are going to lock themselves down out of terror. And we can never persuade him of this argument. He also essentially thought that he'd been gamed on the numbers in the first lockdown. And he thought the NHS would somehow have got through all the stuff about and the was NHS. Was he not concerned about the number of people that, that, that died? I mean, did, did you hear him say, let the bodies pile high in their thousands or it's only killing 80-year-olds? There's been a few different versions of this of these stories knocking around. Um, there was a version of, the, uh, of, of it in the Sunday Times which uh, was not accurate, but the version that the BBC reported was accurate. And you heard that? I heard that in the Prime Minister's study. Okay, and um, next question. That was not then, that was not in September though. That was immediately after he finally made the decision to do the lockdown on the 31st of October. Okay, next question. You showed us a, a whiteboard picture and one of the phrases on it that I think has um, caused some concern is who do we not save? What was the answer to that? Um, well, that, that was asking the obvious question at that point. No, at that point it was too late to stop disaster on the 13th of March was, was my view and the people who I thought you know, had got, figured this out best view. So the, the comment on, on, that comment on there was essentially like, we're already partly over the cliff. Like, who is not going to be saved in this situation? Like, have we figured that out? Who's going to be, who's most vulnerable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? What was, what was the final straw that has prompted you to come and give evidence such as you are today? Um, well, you... Because some would, some would say for a government or prime minister advisor that discretion is important, but you've disclosed everything today, so what, what has prompted that? I think that, um, I think that, I think a couple of things, I think the scale of the disaster is so big that people can't wait, to, like people need to understand how the government failed them when they needed it. People need to understand that now. Who knows what other kind of problems might come along in the next few years that could easily have exactly the same consequences? Because, you know, critical as I've been the Prime Minister, in no way, shape or form can you say this is just his fault. If you just shuffled him around or a couple of ministers or Hancock, everything would suddenly work. It wouldn't. These failings are programmed by the wiring of the system. And if you have something this bad and you've got tens and tens of thousands of people died who didn't need to die, a massive economic destruction the way that we've had it that didn't need to happen if we'd sorted things out earlier. The, everyone in this country needs to face the reality of this. And secondly, it's become clear over the last couple of months that contrary to when I spoke to the Prime Minister about it last year in the summer, he has clearly changed his mind and is now desperate not to face up to this and not to learn the lessons. I think because of the disaster in the autumn. So talking about not learning the lessons, can I ask you just some quick yes, no answers, and then I'll be done, Chair. Um, so I appreciate that you did leave in November, um, but were you surprised by the government delays in putting India on the red list? No, not surprised at all. It's completely in character with number 10. And are you surprised by the confusion on the current travel arrangements with grey, uh, green, amber and red countries? I'm afraid it's deja vu all over again. Who is now advising the Prime Minister? Don't know. And um, are you surprised that people are, are being encouraged to travel this year? I'm not on top of it enough to have a kind of a, a sensible view, I'm afraid, in terms of whether or not people should be travelling. I haven't found it or last year? people. Well, I think, I think lots of things that we did last summer, as I said, I think were, uh, I said at the time, I thought were big mistakes. I th 
Lots of people said to the Prime Minister last year, do not listen to the media or screaming at you about get back to work, physically go back to work, because as soon as you get to September, you're going to be screaming back at everyone again, work from home again, and everyone's going to think that you've lost the plot and the government's lost the plot, and they'll be right. But that was one of the many arguments that I lost on this whole thing. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.